Well, hello out there, my friends. I am Arthur Jones, and I am speaking to you from Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, which is Ben Salem is near Philadelphia. Our topic for today is interpretation of the chest radiograph, a skill that we all need at least to a certain extent. There are especially some, some abnormalities that are emergent and we should be able to identify these and manage them or get somebody to manage them very quickly. And we'll talk about that as we go along. All right, so your objectives for this lesson. When you finish the lesson, you will be able to identify normal landmarks and technical defects and technical defects uh, on a chest radiograph. You will also be able to identify abnormal features on a chest radiograph, and these will include those that are that are due to uh, misplacement of various tubes and lines. Linda has no sound. You need to fix that, Linda. Okay. I'm working before on it, Art. Get before we get into some of the that information. Let's see how a radiograph is produced. Of course, things have changed since the initial production techniques. However, because we get digital displays now. However, the ideas are basically the same. The components of the radiograph are the of the of the the uh, X-ray machine, let's say. Uh, first, there is a cathode tube, which is a source for the electrons that will become X-rays. They are converted by the anode, which is the target, and it converts, converts the electrons to X-rays, and it is the X-rays we are interested in. And then, of course, somewhere in between there, there must be a patient. A patient, the, the tissues of the patient absorb x-rays on basis of the density of the tissue. Then finally, we have the film cassette, which is on the other side of the patient, the, the uh, posterior side, whichever. The film cassette captures the image from the x-rays the x-rays that are not absorbed. All right, here, let's look at the density, uh, the, the effects of density of tissue on the radiograph. First, air. Air will appear black on the film or on the, or on the digital display, air is black because air is the least radiodense substance among the tissues. Then there is fat. Fat appears somewhere between gray and black. It is present subcutaneously along muscle sheaths and also fat surrounds the organs. Of course, the body is 90 something percent water. So we will see a lot of water on a normal radiograph. Water appears gray. We see it in fluid filled tissues such, such as blood, muscle, cartilage, and whatever. Bones appear white. Bone and teeth are the most radio dense normally occurring substances of course there are also we will see on the radiograph we may see contrast media contrast media are used to visualize visualize uh, <coughs> certain structures contrast me media produce a bright white outline of the structure into which they have been injected. The most common contrast medium is barium. However, there are others. 
want to radiograph heavy metals. Heavy metals uh, uh, are, appear solid white. And where do we see heavy metals? Well, we see heavy metals, uh, metals in artificial joints, pins, etc. And heavy metals also appear white on the radiograph, whether it's digital or a film. Okay, so here we go. Here's how it works. The image produced by x-rays are magnified. And that this is a very important point, magnification. Objects that are closer to the source and furthest from the film are more magnified. So we see on we see on this uh, on this uh, cartoon, we see the source producing the x-rays, the objects that we're visualizing in the image. You see how the image is much larger because the object that we are the, that we are studying is is closer to the source and furthest from the film. We'll see why this is important in a minute. Okay, images produced by X-rays are they magnified objects further from the source and closer close to the film are less magnified. You see, if you think about this in the previous one, we'll see that the, uh, the, the difference between the object and the image size is much smaller than it was on the previous, uh, previous cartoon. Okay, look, let's look at the, the, standard, uh, the standard views on a radiograph. The PA or postural anterior view is considered to be the standard view. When you go and have a chest x-ray done, if you are ambulatory, you will be told to stand and hold your, hold your arms above the film. And this does two things. First, it rotates the scapula out of the field on the PA radiograph. Also, with a PA positioning, we get a lesser magnification of the heart because the heart is the heart is closer to the film than it would be on the opposite or the AP positioning. Also, another another advantage of the PA view is that we have what we call anatomic anatomic positioning. The patient is positioned in a normal anatomic fashion. And this is a standard PA view. You can see the heart is not magnified very much at all. It, 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 there's going to be some, magnific <coughs> some magnification because the heart is not direct right on the film. But his, this is a PA view. <laughs> Then, most commonly in ICU and sometimes in the emergency department or in, in the ICUs and EDs, we'll see the AP view, anterior, posterior. This is usually, this is the usual positioning for bedridden, critically ill patients. However, I have worked with, I worked with one uh, one uh, x-ray tech that, that did work very hard to position patients sitting, even very sick patients sitting up so she, so she could get a PA view. This was one excellent technician. Anyhow, at the AP view, we do get greater magnification of the heart. So the heart's going to be bigger than it would be on the PA view. Off also, on an AP view because the patient's arms are not lifted out of the way. The scapula are usually visible and they will actually cloud the radiograph. Another problem with the AP view <coughs> is 
This is often in a view during expiration. And that makes a big difference too. We're gonna to get to that in a minute. But the same excellent uh, X-ray tech that I worked with would come around in the unit if the patient was in a ventilator and she would have me cycle the ventilator to inspiration so she would get an inspiratory view. Then there is the lateral view. The lateral view, this is, this is looking at the patient from the side. The lateral view adds dimensionality to the study. The left lateral view least magnifies the heart. With the lateral view, we're able to view the cardiac structures and also mediastinal abnormalities. And here we have the lateral view. Then there is the lateral decubitus. The lateral decubitus is, is a lateral view, but this and this one, the patient is lying on their side. The primary reason for doing the lateral decubitus flu is to visualize fluid levels. Important, lateral decubitus, to visualize fluid levels in the pleura. And so it is used primarily to identify a pleural effusion. And here is a lateral decubitus view. We can actually, we, sorry about that. We can, we can actually see in this one, if you see the little black arrows uh, <coughs> on the lower radiograph, those show a fluid level. Pleural effusion. All right. Before we interpret a radiograph, it's very important to look to see whether that radiograph is any damn good. Unfortunately, uh, I have not, uh, not seen a technician as good as my old friend was. And, and if, if the technician is not doing their job well, we will get poor film quality and we need to evaluate that. What are some of the problems with film, with quality? Okay, always evaluate the image quality before attempting to interpret a film of poor quality should be repeated rather than interpreted. Should be repeated. It, it, it would be similar to to getting a to getting a blood gas and being unsure of whether it is venous or arterial. You don't interpret that blood gas either. You get a different one, a better one. We know is arterial. Exposure is an issue regarding the technical, uh, the, the quality. If the exposure is correct, the vertebral bodies should be just visible under the cardiac silhouette. If a film is overexposed, it will appear black because black is the because the air, because air is radiolucent, and if, if the exposure is incorrect, then the then the film will appear more radiolucent. This will hide problems. Underexposed film, on the other hand, appears white because it will be that it will appear to be radiopaque. And this exposure is under the control of the technician, the radiographic technician. Here on the left, we see an underexposed film and it makes it look like the patient has a, an abnormality in their lung when in fact, 
They don't. And those, the patient looks sick. The radiograph looks sick because it's underexposed. However, there's nothing wrong with the patient's lungs. On the other hand, overexposure will do exactly the opposite. We see here on the right what appears to be a clear lung, and it is only appears to be clear because the, the, the film was overexposed. This will hide abnormalities. Patient alignment is another problem. The spine, to, when the, when the x-ray is taken, the patient should be perfectly aligned when possible. It, sometimes they can't be, and that is a problem. The spine should be centered on the trachea and the clavicles. <clears throat> if the patient is rotated, it will magnify some structures larger than they should be, and rotation will make some structures appear radio opaque. So it can make it appear there are abnormalities when there are not. And here we see we see a patient where where we, we see on the left where we have a patient who was rotated. And if you look at the clavicles, the clavicle on the left is slightly lower than the clavicle on the right. So this is rotated. That is the primary thing to look at, the clavicles. However, if it's straight, the clavicles will be even and the structures will appear appropriate. What else do you see in this film? Where the one the, the difference between the, the straight and, and the rotate. Well, the one on the right is asked backwards. The cardiac shadow should be on the left rather than should be on the left rather than the right. So we have a okay, we're good. Also, it's important during a radiograph. Uh, shot that the patient is in the inspiratory phase of ventilation. We need an inspiratory view. Six ribs should be visible above the diaphragm. An expiratory view actually exaggerates the pulmonary markings. It can actually make the x-ray appear to be abnormal when it is not. We need to take that into consideration. An expiratory view also enlarges the appearance of the heart. So on an expiratory view, we can look, see what appears to be cardiomegaly, an enlarged heart, when indeed it is not. An expiratory view, we can tell, shows elevated hemidiaphragms. So the diaphragms will be Will, will be uh, will, will will be elevated, <laughs> and this film is show this shows an expiratory view. We see the hemi diaphragms on both sides are elevated, and we see very much increased lung markings. So this was taken during expiration, and it makes any abnormality look, look much worse than it actually is. Okay, so how do we go about interpreting the radiograph or x-ray, if you will? Let's look at some of the landmarks. We can see the angle, we can see the ribs clearly. We can see the clavicle. There is the aortic arch. The left lung with the bronchioles is visible. The apex of the heart. And we can see the tops of the hemidiaphragms.
so how do we go about interpreting? We do must do a systematic analysis. First, we need to check the placement on the view box. If you have a film, check the placement. If it's on, if it's on, if it's if it's in, in digital form, we still need to check to make sure it's placed correctly. Because if it is if it is placed backwards, everything will be askew. And that just remind me years ago, uh, I was in, in an intensive care unit. I knew nothing about x-rays, but I was trying to, I was trying to determine what I could on a chest x-ray. And it was, it was on a light box. And while I was standing there, a physician, a, physician, a doc came by, he looked at me, he looked at the x-ray and he, he said something the effect of, well, if you're going to try to try to interpret this, at least you put it on the box right. It was on the box, asked backwards, and uh, there I, I felt like a fool. Go figure. It's not the first time. It wasn't the last time. Okay. When we check the film, we need to make sure we check the patient's name. Do we have the correct patient? We need to check the date and the time of the film. And we need to evaluate the technical quality. All of these are important before we really interpret. Interpret. We need to observe the mediastinum. In the mediastinum, we look for the tracheal size and importantly, the position of the trachea. Is it in the middle or is it in the center where it should be? or is it off to the side? <clears throat> and we'll talk about things that move the trachea from one side to the other. We also need to look at the borders, the borders of the heart. And we'll come back to that again. We talk about uh, uh, a silhouette. We look at the CT ratio, that is the cardiac the to thoracic ratio, the size of the heart, compared to the size of the thorax. In adults, it is normally one to two. So the heart should take up about one half of the width of the thorax. We examine the hilum, look for the pulmonary arteries and the bronchi, and also then examine the, the lung field. We need to observe the dome of the diaphragm. Is the, is, is the diaphragm flattened? Is the diaphragm uh, in, in a normal position, in an upward position during expiration? We also need to examine the pleural surface. Do are the parietal and the visceral pleura uh, sliding against one another as they should be? Or is there something in between such as air or fluid? Is there a, uh, a, a pneumothorax, uh, a hemothorax, whatever? We look at the costophrenic angle. That is the angle between the, the angle where the diaphragm and the ribs meet. If the costophrenic angle is blunted, then it is most likely due to fluid in that portion of the lung. We also observe the bones for their, uh, the bones for their, whether they are intact or not. This includes the clavicles and the vertebrae. Are the scapula in view? Again, this shouldn't be unless we have an AP view and the scapula do can really louse up interpretation of a radiograph. We look at the ribs, the skin and the soft tissue and directly beneath the diaphragm. Let's look at some of the abnormalities that we will see on HS radiograph. 
First, there is a thing called the silhouette sign. The silhouette sign, that's the, the silhouette song. Silhouette, silhouette, silhouette. Anyhow, a silhouette sign. Uh, Luke observes the obliter uh, obliteration of the heart border. If the heart border is obliterated, we can't see it on the radiograph. It means that there is a lung infiltrate located anterior to the heart. If there is an overlap of the infiltrate and the heart, if we can see the heart border clearly, that means if there is an infiltrate, it lies posterior to the heart. Okay. Okay, so we're, we're talking about the loss of the contour of the heart. There is an infiltrate, the film on the left. Film on the left, there is an infiltrate, but because the heart border is clear, that infiltrate is posterior to the heart. On the right, we see the cardiac, there is an infiltrate, and the cardiac border is invisible. That means that the that means that the infiltrate is located anterior to the heart. So that would be. What we're looking here will be a right middle lobe uh, lesion. Another abnormality we see on radiographs is called an air bronchogram. An air bronchogram is produced by consolidated or collapsed alveoli. They're consolidated or collapsed alveoli surrounding air-filled airways, bronchi. So we'll see if the, if the alveoli are consolidated, if they're consolidated means a, a co contain fluid, consolidated like in pneumonia or collapses in analectasis, and that means these will appear, the alveoli will appear white on radiograph, but the air-filled bronchi will appear black. So we'll see the uh, air bronchograms. Air bronchograms are commonly present in pneumonia, in pulmonary edema, and in, of course, uh, acute lung injury, ARDS. And here are air bronchograms in pneumonia. You see the black arrow points at the air bronchogram. These are these are air-filled bronchi. This is this would be a right right bronchus, right bronchi. These are air-filled, and you can see them. Normally we, we shouldn't see them, but because they are surrounded by alveoli that are consolidated we can visualize the airways, air bronchograms. Pneumonia, on a radiograph, pneumonia is usually infectious. And we have fluid filled alveoli. This one is a right middle lobe, right middle lobe pneumonia. We see first on the, what appears to be a PA film, a correct film. And then on the right, we see a lateral view. And this is a typical, this, this wedge shape, that, that, is, that is the right middle lobe, clearly seen. Pneumonia can also be, rather than just lobar pneumonia, it can be bilateral and it can be diffuse. 
this is a this is a picture an x-ray of a patient with a se severe bilateral diffuse pneumonia the alveoli are filled with fluid then there are interstitial lung disease interstitial lung disease Common causes include pneumoconiosis, such as any occupational illness, uh, black lung disease, uh, wool sore disease, whatever, pneumoconiosis. We also see hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, sarcoidosis, pulmonary fibrosis, bron bronchiolitis obliterans, which has a different name that you'll see in a minute. Uh, I've, all, I've known it originally as Boop, and I still call it that because I like the cartoon. Uh, also, uh, another source of uh, interstitial lung disease involves collagen vascular disease. Now, a very good doc in San, o San Antonio would always teach that, that, that if you look at an interstitial lung disease, on a radiograph, it appears to be dots and squiggles. And that was a perfect way to describe interstitial lung disease. It doesn't give you a diagnosis, but it does tell you that the lesion is in the interstitial spaces. Here's a picture of interstitial lung disease. You can see dots and squiggles all over the place. We can also see that this is uh, this person uh, is, is, is probably a coach of some type. How do I know that? Well, look at the whistle. <laughs> you can also tell a person's religion often on a radiograph because they lay, have their uh, uh, their uh, Star of David or their uh, crucifix around their neck. And that patient had pulmonary fibrosis. Here is the correct term for BOOP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonitis, also known as bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia or BOOP. And BOOP, uh, interestingly, uh, one, of the, one of the causes of cryptogenic, of COP, one of the causes has been called popcorn lung because the people who worked in factories that produce popcorn using synthetic butter flavoring got sick with or this new got sick with this pneumonitis because of the fumes of that uh, popcorn interesting huh popcorn lung Okay, we also see atelectasis on radiographs, localized atelectasis, localized atelectasis such as low bar or sub low bar. Uh, this is consistent with post operative condition and also with obstruction of the airways, usually with mucus plugs. On a radiograph, there will be volume loss on the affected side. If the atelectasis is severe enough, there will be a mediastinal shift toward the affected side. The, the, the collapsed alveoli pull the mediastinum, including the trachea, the heart, whatever, it toward the atelectasis. This is an important point. Also with atelectasis, we'll see elevation of the diaphragm on that side, the hemidiaphragm. <laughs> and here we have a case of complete low bar atelectasis. This is not a particularly good film, but we see the lung on the right is completely collapsed. And we see the trachea is pulled toward the atelectatic side. 
And if you look at the hemidiaphragm on the right, it also is elevated. Lobar atelectasis. And then there is ARDS, whatever you call it, acute lung injury, ARDS. Uh, in ARDS, we'll see a generalized opacity. You know, it won't be, it, it can be unilateral, but it's, it's very, uh, it's very rare for it to be uh, unilateral. Generalized opacity, there will be volume loss in the lung. And sometimes you'll be able to visualize a hyaline membrane, which is a ground, which is a ground glass appearance. And I've got to be honest with you. For some reason, as my eyes, whatever, I've never, never been able to see the hyaline membrane. On ARDS, we are very likely to see air bronchograms because the alveoli will be uh, will be collapsed, and will have they will surround uh, the, 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 the bronchi, the bronchi, which of course will contain air to black. And here is a film of severe ARDS. And we can see the, the, uh, the yellow arrows actually are pointing at, uh, air bronchograms. See, especially on the right, it is most visible. And a, a, and a post or whatever. Uh, there is the other, uh, RDS is a pulmonary edema. It is, it, it is non-cardiogenic. Well, on the other hand, we have <coughs> cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema is consistent with the history of MI and or, and or con congestive heart failure. Well, on a radiograph, what we see in, in pulmonary edema, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, again, generalized opacity, very much like RDS. However, we will see prominent lung vasculature. The this is because this this is because the pulmonary vessels are full. So the vasculature will be appear very prominent. Another kicker, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. We see cardiomegaly, big heart, and we can also see curly lines, which indicate they're full lymphatics, or they indicate that Mo and Larry are also in the unit. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. Sorry, folks, I've always been a big curly fan. I always love the Three Stooges. I know they're silly, but that's too bad. Okay. <clears throat> This is cardiogenic pulmonary edema. See that heart? The heart is huge. We can also see that the lung vasculature, we can see the, we can see the pulmonary arteries are quite full. I'm not sure. And, and we also see, uh, okay, like I said, cardiomag, fluffy, air full, air, so fluid filled alveoli fluid field, uh, pulmonary vessels, and an enlarged heart. We also may see hyperinflation on a radiograph. Hyperinflation is consistent with severe asthma, especially during an asthma attack, and also with emphysema. With hyperinflation, we get a generalized hyperlucency. You know, generalized hyper, the, the, the film will appear black, blacker than it would normally. We'll see enlarged intercostal spaces. 
the space between the ribs will be greater than it should be. The heart, on the other hand, will be normal or small. Another kicker for hyperinflation is that the di diaphragms will be flattened. This also means that the efficiency of ventilation for the patient is impaired because the diaphragms simply do not work very well when they are flattened. So if we're observing the patient, we also may see intercostal muscle, inter, you know, accessory muscle usage. usage. <clears throat> okay, this is a typical film of hyperinflation. And this could be emphysema, it could be asthma. But we see the film is black. The intercostal spaces are wide wider than they ought to be. We see that the hemi diaphragms are flat. The heart is of a normal size. Unfortunately, we also see this a lot on uh, in, in hospitals, uh, in ICUs, emergency departments, pneumothorax. The pneumo is consistent with, of course, chest trauma. It is also consistent with surgery and insertion of central lines. Often, uh, whenever uh, whenever a a, uh, a hospital gets uh, a teaching hospital gets an influx of new residents, they often get an increased incidence of pneumothoraces because of the new residents. Uh, mis mistakenly inserting uh, inserting chest lines, uh, trocars into the pleural space, you know, missing the vessel. Uh, radiographic signs include of the uh, of the pneumo include uh, hyperlucency in the area of pneumothorax. Also, we can visualize a pleural edge. We shouldn't see a plural edge. It should be, they should be, the plural should be together. However, we'll see a plural edge with a pneuma. If it is a tension pneumothorax, only a tension pneumothorax, we'll see a mediastinal shift away from the affected side. Remember in atelectasis, atelectasis pulls the mediastinum towards itself, a tension pneumo pushes the mediastinum, including the trachea, away. Now, the trachea is the easiest one to see. <clears throat> and here is a rip snorting, tension pneumothorax. What side is it on? What side is, is, is the pneumothorax on? Look at the trachea. Which way is the trachea shifted? Right, folks, the tension pneumo is a right pneumothorax, and you can actually see the pleural edge on this on the right. You can see the pleural edge, and we can also see the trachea and the bronchi, the whole mediastinum is shifted toward the right, away from the left. and this is an emergency situation, this patient needs a chest tube immediately, if not sooner. Whether this radiogas should be taken at all is questionable because this patient will have obvious signs of attention pneumo. This patient will look awful. If you just look at their chest, you'll be able to see that it is a tension pneumo. And there was a very good article published years ago uh, called, we shouldn't shoot this x-ray because the, the patient's clinical signs are enough to tell you this is what it is. And the, the uh, venting, this tension pneumo is an emergency procedure. It needs to be done now. Of course, not all pneumos are tension pneumos. There are also, non-tension 
pneumothoraces. And we can see on, on this film, there is a right-sided pneumothorax. We can see there is a, the atelectatic lung. That right lung is entirely collapsed. However, it, it, it is not a tension pneumothorax because we can see the trachea is centered. So this person needs help pretty quick, but not uh, emergency. Okay, a pneumothorax can also be bilateral. And look at this. We can see that both lungs are collapsed on this radiograph. It happens, Keith. As the uh, <coughs> bumper sticker says, it happens. Okay, now uh, we go other abnormalities on the radiograph include fluid in the pleural space, pleural effusion, or hema and or hemothorax. These are consistent with trauma, of course. We also get pleural, pleural effusions with pulmonary edema and also with carcinoma. The radiographic signs of a pleural effusion include blunting of the costophrenic angle. Remember that costophrenic angle, the angle between the, the diaphragm and the ribs, if it is blunted, it's because there is fluid in there. We'll also get white out of the affected side if there is an AP supine view. AP supine is the most common view done in the intensive care unit because the patients are critical. So the the instead of instead of the fluid, uh just flowing down towards the an erect person, it'll go it'll go down towards the costophrenic angle towards the diaphragm. If the patient is laying flat, the pleural effusion goes throughout the lung. So if we have white out uh, with the pleural effusion. If the patient were to be held erect or put placed otherwise. Uh, that fluid it would not be a whiteout. We'd see a uh, basically clear lung where the fluid isn't. Okay. If the patient is placed in a lateral decubitus positioning, we will see the fluid level also. And here we go. This is a pleural effusion. Obviously, this, this patient is. Uh, sitting or sitting up, this the, the the patient is erect, and we see the fluid in that left lung has nearly filled the entire pleural space. The taken up the lung, the rest of the lung is is basically non-functional. That lung. See, if the patient is placed in a lateral decubus positioning, we can see also, we see a fluid level above, in the upper portion, we see the fluid level that is on the, uh, the patient's left side and on the patient, on the bottom of the, 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 the bottom, lower side of the radiograph, we see A pointing to also the fluid level. This could be the same patient that we looked at earlier, but because the patient is positioned in the lateral to cubist view, we do see the fluid level and we see that the fluid doesn't occupy the whole damn chest, it occupies a portion of it. Also, on radiographs, we also do see various 
medical devices. These are basically radio opaque, except maybe the ET tube, but we should be able <coughs> to identify these devices and also determine whether they are correctly placed because play, misplacements of lines leads to being big problems for the patient. We have endotracheal tubes, which of course we need to be experts on the positioning of endotracheal tubes. We are the one who monitors that on a regular basis. Also, then we have pulmonary artery catheter or a PAC is also known as a Swan-Gantz catheter. They're used interchangeably, same thing. We can also see an intraaortic balloon catheter, IABC, central venous lines, nasogastric tubes, pacemakers, and sternal wires whenever the patient is post sternotomy like an open heart patient. <laughs> okay, this radiograph shows an endotracheal tube in the correct position. It is three, it, it should be three to five centimeters above the carina or the tip should be at about at the fourth thoracic vertebra. See, the patient, the patient is sick, but we also have the, norm, the tube is placed correctly. That's important for us to be able to recognize. Okay, here is an endotracheal tube in the right main stem bronchus. As you know, when an ET tube is misplaced, the most common place for it to go is on the right main stem bronchus because the right main stem bronchus is, uh, has, has a lesser angle than the left from the trachea. It's a straighter shot, so it goes in the right. ET tubes are the most commonly placed uh, uh, supporting devices in the ICUs. And it, uh, uh, if, if you worked in an ICU, you have definitely experienced a right main stem intubation also be, and, and and it's not because it was initially placed incorrectly it's because when the patient also when the patient gets moved around the tube is often uh, becomes misplaced during during the movement of the patient so this is something we need to check again on a regular basis Okay, also nasogastric tubes. These are also, uh, and, and I learned this sort of the hard way years ago, and I'll get into that in a minute. Nasogastric tube, this one is correctly, see the tube is, is in the stomach. You can trace it all the way from the stomach up to the, the upper airways. And then, of course, out to the suction. Occasionally, and this did happen to me once, a nasogastric tube also can enter the lung. And here we have a nasogastric tube that actually has been placed accidentally, of course, nobody did on purpose. But the nasogastric tube is in the lung. Well, when uh, this this happened years ago in, in uh, a cardiovascular used it, uh, we had a patient who, uh, for some reason, uh, we could not get back the tidal volume that we were delivering the ethanolate. We were losing two or three hundred mLs per breath. And of course, uh, I was there. I wasn't working on that patient at that time, but I was there. The therapist did check the ventilator. All the ventilator connections did 
check the endotracheal tube for leaking. And even then, just went ahead, they checked the, the output of the ventilator with a spirometer to make sure that was correct. And the ventilator was working perfectly. There were no leaks. The therapist changed the ventilator. And guess what? The same damn thing happened. Then an astute anesthesiologist came along, looked at the chest radiograph and said, no damn wonder the NG tube is in the lung. So we're losing our tidal volume via the NG tube. Has this ever happened to any of you? Well, if it happened once, it's more than likely it's happened again. It's something to remember. Okay, pulmonary artery cath is swan gans. If they're correct, if they, if they, this sees, just shows <clears throat> a PAC correctly placed, it should be go out to out to the pulmonary artery. However, there are times when there are problems with PACs, and one of them is, and I've, this has happened to me. If the if the swan goes too distally, if it is placed too distally in the pulmonary arteries. It can actually go to a very small pulmonary artery. And then what happens there is that this can cause, uh, th this can cause a, a necrotic lung. It, this a necrotic lung, the other thing you know, when blood is drawn from this pulmonary, from this pulmonary PAC, when blood is drawn from it and analyzed, we can appear, we can actually, the, the results can appear to be arterial blood because instead of, 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 of regular pulmonary uh, circulation going into the catheter, we're actually withdrawing arterial blood from the arterial, from the capillaries, basically. And like I said, I did see this once. That's the end of the new information for this lesson, folks. And uh, we'll just summarize and review here for just a couple minutes. What we did look at during this lesson, we looked at the components of the imaging system, the cathode, anode, of course, and the patient is in there. We looked at the effects of density of tissue and other objects on a, on a radiograph and also the effects of magnification. We looked at the way to uh, uh, analyze it. The technical quality of radiographs looked at the standard radiographic views, normal landmarks, and then how to go about a systematic evaluation. Also, we looked at these abnormalities, abnormal signs, the silhouette sign, and the air bronchogram. Both of these are important, please. He just asked. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brianna. Okay. Pneumonia. We look, uh, include pneumonia, interstitial lung disease, dots and squiggles, atelectasis. ARDS, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and also hyperinflation, as we see in emphysema and severe asthma. Other abnormalities we examine were pneumothorax, pleural effusion, including a hemothorax, and then finally, we look at the placement and misplacement of medical devices such as endotracheal tubes and central lines, et cetera, pulmonary artery catheters, NG tubes. All right, folks, that is the end of this lesson.
and I enjoyed it, and I hope you did too. I hope we had a nice visit. Again, uh, always remember, never forget, life is life, fun is fun, but it gets damn quiet when your goldfish die. Thank you. Bye-bye.